Hello and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Bachner. This is Howard Bachner, and I am pleased to be joined by Bob, Bob Redfield, um, the 18th Director of the Centers for Disease Control. Welcome, Bob. Hey, thank you very much, Howard. Glad Bob, to be here. Bob, before we start, could you tell people a little bit about yourself? Well, um, I uh, grew up, my parents were both at NIH. Uh, my father and mother. My father unfortunately died when I was quite young in the early 50s, but he was a uh, solid scientist. And my mother uh, uh, did uh, biochemistry for many years. Um, I uh, obviously went to uh, Georgetown uh, Medical School and uh, uh, did my training at Walter Reed and then spent 23 years at Walter Reed, uh, largely in infectious disease, uh, doing uh, research predominantly in viruses. Uh, where my interest was and kind of came up uh, in the early years of the uh, AIDS epidemic when I finished my fellowship in 81. Uh, I founded the, uh, the U.S. military's first uh, uh, Department of Retroviral Research to begin the program that the Army did uh, uh, in trying to develop a comprehensive program for HIV, particularly in the area of vaccine development. Um, for HIV. And when I retired after 20 years, went to the University of Maryland, where I co-founded the Institute of Human Virology with Bob Gallo and Bill Blattner to focus on chronic viral diseases um, in the city of Baltimore, where I uh, really treasured the time I went back to practicing medicine, particularly HIV and chronic viral diseases. I led infectious disease, vice chair of medicine at the university, uh, right up until the time that I was asked to uh, uh, be given the opportunity to lead CDC. So, uh, a life before coming to the CDC. Two lives, 20 years. I always say I did 23 years at Walter Reed, and I did 22 years at the University of Maryland. So, I pretty stick with jobs for a long time. I don't think I'm going to get 21 years. Yeah, I'm not, you and I are about the same age. I'm not sure will either of us will get 20 plus years at our current jobs. Um, you, with John Brooke and Jay Butler, uh, colleagues at the CDC, have written an editorial for us that we've just put up on our website, along with uh, uh, two pieces that are in your publication, MMWR. The title of uh, the editorial is Time for Universal Masking and Prevention of Transmission of SARS-CoV-2. And uh, you comment on a research letter uh, from Wang and colleagues, Deepak Bach is the senior author. Uh, and I want to read the results from the research letter, and then you comment on the research letter in JAMA, but also on uh, the very two important MMWR publications that went up today. So this is the research letter in JAMA. Just about 10,000 healthcare workers are tested. 1,271 or just, uh, just under 13% had positive results for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, include all types of healthcare workers. And then during a pre intervention period, the SARS CoV 2 positivity rate increased exponentially from 0% to just over 21%, with a mean increase of 1.16% per day, case doubling time of 3.6 days. During the intervention period, which is masking, the positivity rate decreases linearly from 14.65% to 11.46%, with a mean decline of 0.49% per day and a net slope change of 1.65%. Are the data in, Bob, is, is masking unequivocally necessary uh, in the pandemic? You know, Howard, I think the data is just uh, continuing to mount to really get to the point, as we did in the editorial that we wrote about universal masking, the time is now. I think the data is clearly there that masking works, whether it's a face covering, whether it's a, a simple surgical mask, or whether it's uh, basically, uh, um, uh, obviously, a mask that are used in the clinical setting. I think, uh, I think we're at the stage that whether it's the MMWR that we had uh, that we had out about the stylus that wore the mask and we didn't see transmission, whether it's our household studies that we have now looking at the role of masking versus non-masking in different households. So I think that's really the point. Uh, I tried to say this uh, earlier this week. I was in North Carolina yesterday. Um, you know, I re really do believe if the American public all embrace masking now um, and we really did it completely 
you know, rigorously, uh, maybe more like uh, like the German citizens. Really, the Germans say everyone isolate. I think they got a lot of cooperation. You know, when we probably uh, isolated, we probably had less than half the American public uh, do it. I think if we could get everybody to wear a mask right now, I really do think over the next four, six, eight weeks, we could bring this epidemic under control. Bob, do you have a sense of how we can move the discussion away from politics and more into social good? You know, I, I talked with Ann Chukot, your deputy, a few weeks sure. ago. I spoke to Tony last week, again, trying to depoliticalize it and move it into the realm that we all contribute to public health. Do you, do you have a sense of how we can make that movement? I, I was pleased to see some of the Republican leadership begin to talk about this. <laughs> Well, Howard, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, you know, this is not, masking is not a political issue. It's a public health issue. Um, and uh, it really is a personal responsibility for all of us. Um, and I am, um, you know, heartened to see more and more people now. You know, I'm glad to see the president uh, wear a mask this week and the vice president. Um, clearly in their situation, they could easily justify they don't need to because of all the testing around them and they know they're not infected but we need them for to set the example and as you said other individuals this is not a political issue this is you know, i always say we're not defenseless against this virus the most powerful weapon we have or weapons are basically face coverings something as simple as a simple face covering like this or a simple mask like this uh, washing our hands mm. and 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 really uh, being smart about social distancing. If we all rigorously did this, we could really bring this outbreak back to where uh, it needs to be and shut down transmission. So I just couldn't agree with you more. It's very saddened to see uh, some of these public health issues become so politicized. Bob, it's been a tough two weeks. Uh Everyone knows the data. You know, we're up around an average of 50 to 60,000 new cases a day. Do you have any sense? You see more data than anyone else in the world, the CDC does. Do you have any sense of what the next couple of weeks is going to look like? You know, Howard, if you had asked me that question in March, I might have answered it hmm. uh, because uh, I thought maybe we could predict. I will say that. The humbling thing, and I will answer it to some degree, but the humbling thing that I just want to emphasize is I don't know this virus. I just got introduced to it, you know, six months ago. You know, if this was influenza or measles or HIV or hepatitis, you know, I would be much more able to predict that. I was really one of the individuals who thought we would get a little break in July and August. Okay, well... We didn't get a break in July and August, so I'm I'm reluctant to predict. Although if we do and get to the point that we all do our part, as we just talked about, where I said in your the editorial and in, in JAMA, the time is now, and we really embrace masking, we really embrace the social distancing and hand washing. We could bring this outbreak to a, to its knees, uh, particularly getting to the younger generations to basically fully participate. Um, I do think that uh, if we operationalize those tools, we will see uh, this outbreak get more and more under control. I do want to say, because I think, and this is something to be careful when I say this, because sometimes it's misinterpreted, um, between March, April, and May, we have pretty good data now that this virus really hadn't been substantially uh, circulating in the United States in in uh, January and February. Variety of different evidence we published in the MMWR, and I'm pretty confident that there was very limited virus in um, January and February. But in March, this virus really started to transmit, particularly with the European introduction to our nation. Uh, and, and between then and um, April and May, we diagnosed over 2 million people. When we went back and looked using antibody testing to get an understanding of how extensive the infection was in that period of time it was probably about 10 to 1 so it's important for people to emphasize between march and april and may we probably actually had 20 million infections in the yeah. united states even though we only diagnosed 2 million so if you do do the math that means we are having 150 200 000 infections a day even though we were only diagnosing 
you know, 20,000 a day. So even though I don't want to be misinterpreted that I think the current situation is good, it's not. We have a very significant problem right now, particularly in, in Florida, Texas, Arizona, California, now South Carolina. It looks like things are starting to heat up in parts of Tennessee. So this, um, this is a serious issue, as you know. We're currently diagnosing, say, 60,000 cases a day. I don't know how many infections that really represents. Right. I, assume, I assume we're better than 10 to 1 now. Right. But, but the fact is um, I'm not – I'm trying to say that I'm not, not – um, certain that actually in April and May we weren't having significant infections. We just didn't we didn't realize it. The good news is that um, with the younger population, we're seeing um, we're seeing less mortality right now. You know, again, I don't want to get ahead of the data because it's going to lag. You know, when you see what's happening in California and Arizona and Florida, but it, at least. Uh, you know, we're averaging, you know, much fewer. I think today we were in the mid 200s, yesterday in the mid 300s. Um, I don't think we've gotten back over a thousand, you know, and back in March we were at 2,500 deaths a day. So if there's any good news is, is that there's less mortality associated, but we have a very significant outbreak that's ongoing right now uh, across this nation, particularly in the states that I mentioned. Just to clarify for people, that 10 to 1 ratio is, is based upon serology. And actually, that paper will be published in JAMA Internal Medicine. It's from the CDC, and it'll be published early next week for people to look at. That data isn't currently available. It's always older data, even if it's just a few months, few months ago. Bob, one of your areas of expertise has been the development of an HIV vaccine, which has really been a struggle. Uh, what do your instincts tell you about a, a vaccine uh, uh, for COVID-19? You know, Howard, I'm very um, optimistic. Um, I had thought that just the nature of these coronaviruses are that uh, they're not as complicated uh, in terms of, uh, uh, like, say, for example, like flu, where we think there's going to be a lot of variation in the antigens that are required for a protective response. Um, and again, a lot of that is drawn from our experience with MERS and SARS, but it's also from some animal model data now we have with COVID-2 that I think that, that, that this is a highly technical feas feasible accomplishment to develop a vaccine against this COVID virus. Um, but where I'm really um, uh, optimistic is to see how the government and the private sector have really come together in a, in a coordinated response that I've not seen before in government, I mean, in private sector. So when we talk about Operation Warp Speed, I mean, this is a very serious uh, private sector, government sector partnership that is laser focused on a mission. And again, you know, I spent time in the military, so I, I like that concept of focusing on a mission. And the mission is to have a vaccine available to the American public by January 2021. And it's sort of, if it's not on that critical path, it's not on the path. And so as we went through a series of potential vaccines and narrowed it down uh, to a group and then eventually narrowed it down even further, uh, the vaccines that were selected for accelerated development were those vaccines that uh, could meet that mission. There were other good vaccines that may not be able to get production to where it needed to be until July 21 or July 20 or uh, January 22. They'd still be developed on their own pace, but they're not on the mission. So I think uh, I'm I'm optimistic that we'll have one or more vaccines available um, before the first of the year. Uh, you can never predict science. Um, but I do think that uh, that uh, we're on an accelerated course here that I've I've not witnessed before. Uh, many people have expressed concern about the coming fall and then winter months. We'll we'll get to schools in a bit, but uh, you know, flu or flu arrives in in October, November. It depends a bit upon where you live. Um, any optimism about bridging therapies, monoclonal antibodies, hyperimmune immunoglobulin, anything that can help protect healthcare workers, the elderly, before a vaccine were to be available? Do you have any sense if those are moving along? I haven't seen much clinical trial data about those. 
Yes. Yeah, so again, another area of optimism from my perspective. I mean, clearly the advances with Redesivir and now our understanding about steroids, but um, I think a lot of us have hopes. We have to wait and see the data that comes out from the FDA on the con on the on the plasma, on the convalescent right. plasma. But that data should be coming out soon. I think it's going to show us something because the diversity of the antibody, even though it's not a controlled clinical trial you can then look at the results based on the antibody profile that the individual got. So I think we'll have a pretty good idea of what antibody profile is associated with a therapeutic uh, effect, all right? And again, I have, the data's not out yet, so I don't want to get ahead of it, but um, I think it's going to be telling. That said, um, you know, we continue to encourage the American public, there's over 3 million now that have been infected to con you know, consider going to your blood bank and donating uh, plasma so we can continue to collect more because if in fact we do find the characteristics and it's interesting not all the plasma that people got had antibody in it you know <laughs> what i mean so you'll be able to in a way you'll have a way to sort the data but uh, to donate because if that we can get plasma of the right type for the fall as you mentioned but we also then if we have extra can get plasma to make hyperimmune globulin. Right. You know, that then could be used for prophylaxis or at least studied for prophylaxis in nursing homes and healthcare settings. Um, but probably what I'm most optimistic about is the monoclonal antibodies. Ah. As you know, as you know, this week yeah. uh, the HHS gave a little over $400 million a, uh, to Regeneron to accelerate production of their monoclonal antibody. They're uh, going into clinical trials as we speak. Those clinical trials. Uh, aren't going to take you know that long to know if they work or not. Um, I was really impressed when I saw the impact of Regeneron's monoclonal antibodies in the uh, uh, in, in in Eastern Congo, where where Tony Fauci and his team were conducting a randomized clinical trial in a war zone, uh, and we watched the mortality rate. I mean, you could tell something was different. Even though the con, you know the control arm might have been radesivir, then we had the monoclonal antibody one one four from NIH and Regeneron, and all of a sudden we were seeing not seventy percent death, but we were seeing eighty percent survival. You know, so I'm I'm hopeful there. I think the monoclonal antibody because that goes back to what you said. If the monoclonal antibodies are shown to be efficacious, then that's a bridge for for. Right. Prophylaxis, uh, particularly for the nursing homes and particularly for the high-risk healthcare workers. So I'm, I'm really optimistic that the innovation of science. You know, I come back to where we we started. Uh, when I started in HIV, my patients lived less than a year, and you know it was pretty tough to see, you know, wonderful you know, young individuals in the prime of their life die no matter what you did. Um, and yet now we see science has made HIV so that not only can you live a near normal lifetime, but you know, we're on the verge. If we continue the efforts, we can bring an end to the epidemic in this nation between now and 2030, which is one of the uh, goals that I had when I came into CDC and I continue to see that. So I'm optimistic that the therapeutics are going to give us uh, uh, a, a broader armamentarium as we go. But I am worried. I do think the fall and the winter of 2020 and 2021 are going to be the, probably one of the most difficult times that we've experienced in American public health because of what you said, the co-occurrence of COVID and influenza. And this is where we'd like to continue to work with you to get the American public to embrace the influenza vaccine Yeah. Uh, so we can try to minimize the impact of influenza because I think those two respiratory pathogens hitting us at the same time do have the potential to stress our health system. And when you really look at the differential mortality across the country, it was quite significant. Sometimes New York, five, six, seven, eight percent. A lot of that mortality is driven by the stress of the healthcare system that the patients are in that are trying to be taken care of. And so keeping the healthcare system from being overstretched, I think it's really going to be important. And the degree that we're able to do that, I think, uh, will define uh, how well we get through the fall and winter. Bob, um, about six weeks ago, we published an opinion piece uh, by two people from Hopkins. John, uh, Josh Sharstein was the le lead uh, author about opening the schools. It's now been in the newspaper every day. Just yesterday, San Diego and Los Angeles announced that they would open, but it would be electronic only. 
Um, and the CDC issued uh, recommendations. American Academy of Pediatrics has issued recommendations. The CDC is a remarkable collection of individuals who for decades have been committed to the health and public health of, of the country. What's it like? What's it like when you're criticized by the leaders of the country? How, how does the CDC react to that? Well, you know, um, what I try to do, and I don't have it in front of me, I wish I did, but I'll paraphrase. Yeah, that's fine. I, I try to uh, stand up and say, uh, never mind the critic. You know, the credit goes to the man or woman that's in the arena, all bloodied and marred, tries, comes up short, tries again, comes up short again. And at the end of the day, they either know the triumph of high achievement or if they fail, they fail while knowing they dare greatly. So I think it's so important to stay focused on the mission. You know, and you did say it right. We have thousands and thousands of dedicated men and women uh, that are committed to the public health of this nation. And that energy has got to stay focused. When I became CDC director, I had to give an all hands in the first couple of days. My wife was in the front seat and I kind of broke up. I mean, I kind of lost it. I started to kind of tear up because I said, you know, uh, you know, CDC is a data-driven, science-based organization. And when I was at Walter Reed for 23 years, I was with a group that were data-driven, science-based. But CDC at, at its heart is a service organization. And these men and women uh, commit their lives to serve this nation. And when I was at Walter Reed, I was surrounded by men and women that were committed to serve this nation. And I didn't realize how much I missed being part of a big service organization. Because, you know, you were up in Boston. We go into academia. We still try to do our best. We still try to serve. But it's a different culture. Oh, absolutely. So, so they are great. And I think it's important. Part of my job is to try to keep them motivated. You know, try to my job is... Let's um, let's do the postmortem on this outbreak once we're through it. I do think if we could just unite as a country, realizing that we do have tools, we're not defenseless. Uh, we need to do the best again. And as my Teddy Roosevelt quote said, uh, we'll 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 make mistakes, we'll fail, we'll come back again as a group. But at the end of the day. Uh, we have an opportunity to have high achievement. And I will say, I believe that the guidance that the men and women at CDC try to give, I think, uh, and the energy, and they are working 24 seven, um, it's exceptional. And I don't like to see people get demoralized because, and it, it, you know, no one likes to be negatively criticized in the newspapers. I mean, I don't personally like it. I've had my share of it. That's but an understatement. It, it comes with the, you know, if you if you decide to define yourself by external criticism, uh, I would tell you this isn't a job for you. Well, it's an extraordinary, it's an extraordinary organization with decades of uh, of uh, achievement, and um, I I think the medical community, the public health community wants the CDC to succeed and achieve and continue to make strong recommendations. And if people disagree with them, so be it. But I, I think we rely on the CDC to make the best evidence-based recommendations. And then other people have to make decisions about how they react to it. So um, uh, I was so pleased to see the school recommendations. I know they're difficult. I know they're a struggle. I know it's a critical issue for the country. Um, but um, I, I think it was important for you to issue them and then let people think about what you're saying. Um, but it still can't be easy for you, Bob. Well, you know, I reflect, uh, you know, I know that on December 31st is when I first uh, uh, was informed of 27 individuals in Wuhan, China that had an undefined pulmonary illness. 
And it, I think it's, you know, for people who don't know, January 1st, we activated our incident management system, you know, at that time. And then on the 22nd, we activated our entire emergency system for CDC. And that was the day we had the first course in America, case in America. We knew, you know, when I saw these original cases in China, uh, I was very concerned, you know, that this was uh, uh, going to be problematic for us. And I obviously worked with my counterpart in China at that time. Um, and I think very early on, my CDC colleagues brought me models. And I'll remember when they came in and showed me the models of what they thought we were up against. And that model showed one, 1 million to 2.4 million people would die before October. And, you know, I do, I, you'll never prove what didn't happen. But I do think our collective response, while not perfect, meaning CDC and our government as a whole, um, I do think we've really made an impact against the potential uh, mortality that we could have seen. Both the president's decisive action to close travel to China and Europe, I mean, those weren't easy decisions. Um, and, you know, I think our initially our 15 days and then another 30, so 45 days to close. Uh, we tried to give states guidance on how to reopen safely. I think the guidance that we put out was really sound. I think if you look critically, few states actually followed that guidance. Um, although I don't think the reopening is what's driving the current southern expansion right now. It's very interesting that if you look at all the states across the south, if you look at the northeast and we had it, it was here, then here, then here, then here. If you look at the south, Everything happened around June 12th to June 16th. It all simultaneously kind of popped. So independent of whether you reopened, didn't reopen, you know, when you reopened. So we're of the view that there was something else that was the driver. Maybe the Memorial Day, not weekend, but the Memorial Day week, where a lot of Northerners decided to go south for vacations. The Southern groups had never really taken the mitigation steps that seriously because they really didn't have an outbreak. Uh, but something happened in mid-June that, that we're now confronting right now. And it's not as simple as just saying it was related to timing of reopening, not reopening. It's interesting. You made a, a comment uh, right after I'd asked the question about, you know, the CDC could have done better. The FDA could have done better. I think journals could have done better. You know, I, I would hope at some point we would all reflect to understand what is it that we could do better. Or I, I do it on a daily basis because we continue to publish. I'm sure you do it on a daily basis to know what is it that we could do better to make sure the messages are clearer and are better accepted by the American public. That That's where the struggle has been, I think. Yeah, I mean, that's what was good about one of the MMWRs that we put out today was, you know, one was on the effectiveness of masks in, the, in, a, uh, in a high-risk setting like the hair salons. The other one was the progressive acceptance of wearing face coverings and how we saw a progressive increase, particularly among Hispanics and African Americans. Uh, uh, I think the more now that we get with the editorial that you published today and the more that I think we're being very clear now, or, or, you know, now's the time to wear a mask. And as you say, there's consistency of message from the public health people. There's consistency of message now by civics leaders. Then I think, you know, we, and there's actually more um, community pressure. You know, I, I flew the other day to South Carolina. Uh, there was nobody in Charlotte Airport that wasn't wearing a mask. Uh, occasionally I saw somebody uh, in uh, when I was walking on the street, but you could see people kind of, or if I, if someone forgot to put their mask on, you could see people all starting to look at them. Yeah. Like, you know. uh, so I think, I think we're getting to where we need to be, Howard. Last question. I know they've told me to be very careful about your time. So the last question, um, you know, some states have really tried to do tracking, tracing, testing, and quarantine. It's been a struggle in the U.S in part because we have more restrictive laws around privacy. So if you look at Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, Korea, they uh, really gather an enormous amount of information some, from people's phones and then integrate it with the EHR, the electronic health record. Bob, do you, do, you think we, do you think we can do tracking, tracing, and quarantine in the United States at a massive scale? You know, I'm trying to even 
frame it a little different, you know, okay. as I look at no, not not from you. I'm just saying as I'm trying to work with the airlines, for example, to help right. us. I'm trying to move it to a positive thing where that we're trying to give people the benefit of being of notification. You know, you say the word tracing and everybody ah. kind of gets, you know, but, you know, the challenge that we have with uh, traditional public health of diagnosis, a contact tracing, uh, isolation, of course, is the biological nature of this virus being so asymptomatic. You know, the fact that we may have, I think now that it's moved into the younger age group, we probably have over 50 percent of the infections lack symptoms. So, you know, it doesn't negate that we still want symptomatic and the ability to do the contact tracing when we can. But I do think contact tracing by itself, we're not going to get to where we need. And this is why we've advocated uh, jurisdictions really think through surveillance strategies like testing everyone in the nursing home, like uh, doing everyone that's homeless, like prisons, like setting up some sentinel surveillances. So you begin to understand how this virus is moving in different populations. I'm even looking at piloting now uh, to go into smaller communities like I was down in North Carolina. It's very interesting. You know, over a third of the cases in North Carolina are among the Hispanic Latino community. We originally saw about eight um, counties in North Carolina about six weeks ago light up and they were they were disproportionately Hispanic and we're saying, what's going on? Of course, then after that, we saw the Hispanic communities across the South and also in, in Milwaukee and in, 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 in Salt Lake City. Something's going on in the Hispanic community about community transmission that, that we don't have our hands around. So we've thought about the, the advantage to go ahead and do what we call community-led testing. So rather than go in and try to figure out who's symptomatic and contact trace. Why not, if there's 10,000 people in the community, why don't you evaluate what it would take if we just evaluated, tested all 10,000, figure it out in a three to five day period who's infected, who isn't, and see if that's a strategy that can can help bring the outbreak down to uh, under control in that community. Looking at the use of genotyping, very interesting study up in uh, Minnesota where um, they looked in a nursing home and, and, you know, there was a significant number of residents were infected and there was a significant number of workers that were infected. The residents all had a single genotype, basically. They were all traced to the same lineage. The, the workers in the nursing room had multiple, multiple genotypes. So you were getting multiple, multiple right. viruses right. in the workers. So in a way, the transmission in a nursing home is probably a rare event from worker to nursing home. But when it happens... So, so these are things that I think we are going to need to be more innovative. I do think we're going to have to look at some of these broader community-based testing strategies. I think we, um, but that's not for us to throw away the importance of traditional diagnosis, contact tracing. You know, when I uh, polled the nation in, in January, we were down to 6,000 contact tracers in the country. We had some states that had less than 50, right? You know, I've estimated we need about 100,000. Yeah, right. You know, we're up now on June, we were up, up to close to 28,000, and we're tending to increase. And a lot of states are doing a lot of good work increasing that human capacity. But I will say, you know, it comes back to hopefully one of the legacies that I'll have as my time as CDC director is trying to highlight kind of the truth, which is, for the last five decades, we failed to invest in a meaningful way in public health in this nation. Um, if the COVID outbreak hasn't taught us anything, it's taught us now's the time. Yeah. Now's the time to get over-prepared in public health. Now's the time to build the data, data modernization, data analytics, predictive data analysis we need, the laboratory resilience in public health labs with multiple platforms, the public health workforce that has the contact tracers we need, and our global footprint so we can see this stuff coming, uh, detect it, respond to it, and prevent it uh, at its source. And you know, I, this is the message I try to say to Congress is now's the time to give this nation the public health system that not only it needs, that it but it deserves. Last question, because I, I know they'll irk me if I don't get you back to your next meeting. What's it been like 
to be in front of Congress so often and for so long. I'm amazed that you can all stay awake. But what what's it uh, like you all stay awake? I, I'd be napping. What's what's it like to testify before Congress so regularly uh, with questions coming uh, from all different directions? Well, you know, it's critical that we can effectively communicate the value of our agencies because ultimately it's the Congress that gives us the resources that we require. Um, and I think it's important um, to not be defensive to the questions. Sometimes, you know, I know when I did my first oversight hearing, uh, I don't think it was my best moment <laughs> because, you know, they're rough, you know, and I think it's important to realize that um, these men and women, you know, they have a job to do too. And, uh, so I've tried to listen and, and I try not to be defensive um, and, uh, and to try to give them substantive answers that hopefully will motivate them to see the importance of supporting, for me, supporting CDC and public health in this nation. You know, I'm hopeful that they'll continue uh, to uh, uh, provide that support. It's interesting in the last three months, Congress has given CDC over $18 billion. That's a lot of money. It is. Right. But we needed it. And, you know, I'd love to see CDC's budget, you know, rather than $7 billion a year, I'd rather see it 15 to $20 billion a year because I think we could use that money to make the public health of this nation, um, you know, uh, much more resilient and, and be more prepared for the next outbreaks. But those are my decisions. Ultimately, the, you know, the HHS administration, Congress. But I do think that if there's any central message that I have, it's that, you know, now is the time. And I, I'm, I'm concerned that, you know, a year from now when the vaccine's there, everyone will forget about the pain that we've been through with COVID. And so I'm hopeful that uh, Congress makes a definitive decision to uh, much more heavily invest in public health, what I call the core capabilities of public health, and to do it not in supplementals, but to do it in base funding right. so that we can build for the future. This is Howard Bachner, and I've been uh, delighted to be joined by Bob Redfield, the 18th director of the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, Bob, thanks for joining me today, and, and keep issuing those guidelines, stick to your guns, and let the critics, uh, you know, be critical, but but keep giving us those evidence-based recommendations. Thanks for joining me today, Bob. Yeah, thanks a lot, Howard. Thanks. Bye-bye. Stay healthy. Yeah, thanks. God bless.